Okay, let's start. So today we, we are going to wrap up the lecture and with we, I mean, it's me and ChatGPT is co-teaching today. And uh, I already asked it a little bit whether it's ready so you can read about that. So it's there, maybe um, if the problem is it's, it's still textual, so it's not here as a robot, it's not speaking to you in person. We have to write uh, things in the chat here. Yeah? Maybe uh, can you say hello to the students? Oops. So it crashed already again. But <laughs> well, you can re read this. Uh, so it's, it's really um, hard to connect to the thing. Um, can you say hello to my students in the database systems lecture? Okay, yeah. So I will uh, swap uh, um, in between slides and then asking ChatGPT and then we can discuss ChatGPT's Chat um, answer. So that's the plan for today. Let's see how far that takes. So some of the answers are really impressive. I really recommend you to try this thing out. And the other thing I should really, uh, have you, uh, did any of you try out GitHub Copilot? If not, do it now. <laughs> not, not, not now after the lecture, that's fine, okay. Yeah. But you can integrate it in basically any IDE and the results are insane. It's really insane, the proposals it makes. Some, sometimes they're crap, sometimes they're unbelievable. Yesterday I had the experience, yeah, I got a proposal. I, you just write the name of a method, yeah, and tell them what the method should be about. Then it makes a proposal like five lines of code, and I stared at the code for 10 seconds and then said, yeah, that, that's actually correct. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's really impressive. Yeah. Times are changing. Okay, with that, let's start the recap um, session. So, um, so I will go through the different slide sets one by one. So we had that slide set 0 0.1, and I just give, the, give you a brief summary of the most important things you should uh, take away from uh, that week we looked at that. Yeah? So we started with the storage, and in particular the storage hierarchy, so the different um, so the trade-off you have with respect to uh, the faster uh, memory becomes and the higher the bandwidth, the more expensive it becomes, so the costs per byte increase. Um, whereas um, if you go um, uh, the slower and uh, memory gets, the cheaper it gets, so you make a compromise and that's the storage hierarchy. So you make a, a layered architecture of fast, small storage versus um, bigger, slower storage. And then these storage layers interact somehow. We learned in detail how they interact, but it's basically a compromise uh, to um, have an affordable a storage system and that's used widely in many systems. I showed you this analogy. Um, so if we scale those factors to something humans can understand, then L1 cache is like grabbing a piece of paper from your desk. Um, L2 is like um, picking up a book from a nearby shelf. L3 is like picking up a book from next room, 30 seconds. DRAM is like walking down the hall, that's 90 seconds. And then if you do the math, well, then hard disk, really, really the spinning platters is like walking from Saarland to Hawaii, yeah? 7.5 million seconds of walking or 86 days. So the time it takes to access data on a specific storage layer varies really dramatically. So you want to organize your algorithms, want to organize your system um, that you always have quick, quick access to the data. So again, in database systems, the problem is not so much CPU, the, the problem is getting the data into the CPU. That's the majority of, uh, of our concerns, really. Yeah, and then we talked about typical sizes of those storage layers, and uh, also the relative sizes. Uh, that is uh, misleading when you look at the textbook example. So I uh, presented this um, area, um, yeah, this plot that uh, yeah is um, where the areas really represent the size, and then you see the the, dif the difference. Yeah, if you look at L1, what the size is to L2, L3, and so forth. Yeah, and the thing underneath the horizon you see is DRAM, so you have to zoom out. So it's more, it's really something like that. So, so it really makes a difference which data of DRAM is put into L1 and L2, because that makes a huge difference in access times and performance overall. So the tasks of those layers um, are similar. So localization of data objects of a layer above requests an object. The layer should be able to uh, return that object if it exists or tell you, oh, it's not there. So we have to do something. So it's caching of data from lower layer. That's what's called the inclusion property. So typically a higher layer, a layer closer to the CPU includes a subset of the data uh, of a storage layer from underneath. 
Then we have to worry about these data replacement strategies like LRU. Uh, the different strategies at different layers, some are in hardware, some you can um, change in software, of course. And you have to think about how to write modified data. And we discussed that, and it's very important to make sure that not on every write you write the change data through the entire storage hierarchy. That would completely ruin performance. Yeah? So you, you want to have a system that makes um, use of the storage data with respect to reads and writes. Yeah? So when writing and modifying something in L1, it doesn't imply that you directly write it through to your hard disk. Yeah? And only if it was written to hard disk, you say, yeah, I committed it. Yeah? That, that would completely ruin performance. So you need clever algorithms that allow you to do um, exactly that. So the read and write strategies, um, caching we discussed. So reading means pulling up the data and writing means, means pushing down. Yeah? Writing means pushing down in the storage hierarchy. Um, we talked about the database buffer. So basically the, the database buffer um, yeah, loads parts of the data from flash or hard disk into main memory. And then we have to worry about things like replacement strategies. For instance, and what is a good replacement strategy? We looked at the assignment sheets. Um, um, on the assignment sheets, we looked at that in particular when you have different workloads. It may mean that different um, replacement strategies, strategies may have different effects. Yeah? So they really have an impact in, a, in the database world. So the summary here was really um, the properties of the storage hierarchy impacts query processing efficiency. What you do algorithmically is similar on all layers from L1 down to SSDs to servers on the internet. So I showed you this graph where, where I said, okay, yeah, you can basically also extend the storage hierarchy beyond your local disk to servers on the internet. So servers in a different data center than servers in Frankfurt, servers on a different continent, servers on a different planet. That's all a big um, storage hierarchy which also implies that whatever you do in a network in terms of reading, caching, writing, it's, it's all the same, all the same techniques. Yeah, read strategies, what to read when, caching strategies, what to keep on a layer until when, hardware versus software. So some of the things are done in hardware. You can't change them, but some can be changed in software. Write strategies we discussed. Yeah, and we also talked, of course, about this big problem of random versus sequential I.O. In particular, for devices where random I.O. is really painful or makes a huge difference. Disk platters, for instance, with spinning disks, there yeah, the random I.O. is super expensive. And you have to be careful with your algorithms. For SSDs, not so much. And we discussed about these special cases like split layers, where on the same conceptual storage layer, you have different physical devices. An example for that is NUMA. But more important, of course, is RAID, uh, redundant array of inexpensive disks. You not only use one disk, but you somehow combine them in a certain uh, fashion. And then, yeah, um, and then you, you, you get uh, typically um, the advantage that you can lose a certain number of disks depending on the RAID level, but you get also performance advantages. And we discussed that along the lines um, of, of, rate, of the different RAID levels, okay? So with that, maybe let's ask uh, ChatGPT whether it wants to add something. So Mo, what do you think? What do you think are the most important things a computer scientist should know about um, storage in a database? Database system. Okay. Okay, so it's mixing up a couple of things, yeah? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> um, data modeling and normalization, yeah, not so much. It's more on the conceptual level, of course. Yeah, indexes, separate section, transactions, well, conceptual thing. Storage engines may uh, make a difference, but here it's um, relational database. This is also a conceptual thing, whether it's relational database or NoSQL database. Column, sometimes in a NoSQL domain, 
uh, NoSQL database systems were, are branded as column now databases, which is, doesn't make any sense because the relational system could also sit on a column store. Yeah, it's still relational, uh, so maybe it uh, wrapped that on some web pages. Yeah? Um, okay, maybe can we ask back? You can always ask back, right? Um, data compression and standard. Can we go into that? It's also a different uh, section, data security. It's, it's a wide potpourri of topics, I have to admit, from, from this answer. Um, okay, get a coffee. I will be right back. So, um, with that, I think we should enter the second topic. Is it there to respond to that? No, it's you can con you really confuse <laughs> the RSE things, right? It's really a, a what? <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's getting the coffee, actually, right? Maybe some virtual coffee in some neural network universe. Sure thing. No, I mean, you get the coffee, right? <laughs> anyway, so second thing was how to speed up systems by improving its data throughput. So really data layouts. So I told you about um, um, this is a high-level picture. Basically, you have this relational world. You talk about sets of tuples. You map that somehow to your devices eventually. And there are different mapping steps on the way. So the first is you linearize somehow the different attribute values. And that's shown here. So you have a curve here. You uh, assign through those data values. Then this is serialized to virtual pages you have virtual page IDs in, in, in virtual, in almost all computer systems I'm aware of. And then those virtual page IDs are mapped to physical pages and those physical pages are actually stored eventually on DRAM, disks or whatever. Yeah. And then we looked at the different mapping steps. Most important is row versus column layout. Um, so in the row layout, you would have a curve, a linearization curve like that. Yeah, so you um, linearize one row after the other. Yeah, that's the row layout. Doesn't matter that this is the first one here and that is the second. I don't care, it's just row by row, row wise. And in the column layout, in, in contrast, you first linearize across um, all attribute values of all rows. Yeah? So first this, 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 yeah, then that column uh, is linearized. Then the next could also be this one, this, that, that, and then this yeah? order again across columns doesn't matter. It's just column wise, that's the important thing. Yeah, and then we looked at uh, different queries that are good in one layout, but not so good in the other. So typically, if you select many attributes, a row layout is a good idea. Uh, if you do inserts and deletes, a row layout is a good idea because there are a few places uh, in the linearization order where you have to do something. Yeah, that's why the row layout shines. In contrast, yeah, it's again the disadvantages, disadvantages. So in contrast, the column layout uh, typically works well for more like analytical queries when there's no index in particular. So when you uh, select few attributes, uh, typically also followed by some grouping uh, condition, then a column layout is a good idea. Also in situations when you add columns to your schema uh, with alter table, add or drop a column, uh, or any kind of aggregation. It doesn't have to have a group by any kind of aggregation where you read many, many columns, um, many, many tuples conceptually and it's typically a good idea to do something like that. So, um, yeah, I wrote down again pros and cons of those. So we have two extremes, row layout and column layout. Then there are these hybrid layouts, uh, PAX partition across. Uh, also comes in different names like Parquet. Actually, our database system Mutable also uses PAX basically. It doesn't make a big difference. If you have very big pages, yeah, these, these uh, horizontal blocks you use in, in PAX layout, I think I have a figure on that somehow. Yeah, that's a PAX layout. Basically, we have one horizontal partition, and inside that horizontal partition, you do a column layout. Well, and obviously, if you enlarge the number of tuples, yeah, if you, uh, um, yeah, let, yeah, the number of tuples, is if, you, if you let that go towards infinity, you will be approaching column layout. Yeah. So if, the, if, if k is the number of tuples here, maybe I can go back here and scribble it here. So this, this is uh, the number of tuples here is six. Yeah, but if you make uh, uh, k approach plus infinity, then you approach the column layout. If you make k approach one, then you approach the row layout, obviously. Yeah, so 
you have to set this um, k value meaningfully. Okay, yeah, so that's a patch layout, basically doing horizontal partitioning and then the different, uh, yeah, and then within a block you can do whatever you want. Yeah? But here it's column layout. We talked about compression, super important, uh, because the goal here is not to save um, a storage space, yeah, to, to, have, to be able to, to use a smaller SSD or a smaller hard disk, but actually to save bandwidth. Uh, think about this post, um, post delivery service. Yeah, so you delivering, uh, I think I had this example with air balloons. They don't inflate the air balloons, put them in the, in the truck, and then you deliver them. Yeah, you, you keep them as they are, squeezed, yeah, then you put them in the truck, and then uh, the recipient inflates the balloons. Yeah, so that's basically the same idea. Um, get rid of redundant information that you can reconstruct to, to save bandwidth. So that's a very uh, important use case, and we talked about dictionary compression which is a straightforward thing to do in a database system. You can do it on the schema level, of course. Yeah, basically, um, when you have your a relation, yeah, you can have foreign keys, like that's a foreign key to your streets, and that's a foreign key to your cities. Yeah, you can do that on the schema level, but you can do that inside the engine in many different ways. In particular, when you create custom domains um, through enum uh, in SQL, you have a similar effect. Yeah, and we looked at the query rewrites you do. Yeah, if you uh, do a rewrite like that, then basically um, a lookup like on a specific street would first hit the dictionary, of course, select the appropriate key, that is three in that case, and then with that three here down below, you can basically do the actual lookup on the table colleagues three. Yeah, that makes query processing actually more efficient in many cases. Yeah, um, I, I think I said that relationship to main encoding. So dictionary compression um, is a good idea when you, in particular, when you can convert strings to numeric data. Single row access is still possible. That's a big advantage. And you may apply additional compression methods and it can be exploited for query processing as shown above. Huh? However, you have extra joints that may hurt also depending on the schema and the scenario. Yeah, we looked at other um, Compression methods like run length encoding, um, they're rarely used in database systems, but still they exist. So this compression technique, uh, I think, was first generated in for images. If you have images with white and black pixels, you can easily encode the number of white pixels in a row and black pixels in a row. So in database systems, it doesn't make too much sense. Seven-bit encoding, however, is a flexible scheme that allows you to compress data if for instance, integers have varying lengths. Yes, you have very long integers and small integers, uh, short integers. And if you want to put them, yeah, if you can't do anything about that, the main trick is rather than storing eight, using all the eight bits of a byte to store information, you just uh, use seven of the bits for the data and one for the signal bit. Yes, yeah, so you re recall, hopefully. And then the signal bit, if that is set to true, it means there's another byte following. Yeah? So in this case here, so this is a, this seven bits concatenated, that seven bits gives you this bit, and that is um, yeah, the, the number you represent here. So one means another byte is following, zero means there's no more bytes following. And that's a super flexible scheme, of course. Not so nice for query processing, but in terms of storage, it's pretty good. Yeah, that's my summary here. So. Those data layouts may have a huge impact on the performance of database systems. So there was a, there's a whole history of database systems whose single idea was to change the data layouts. In particular, in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, yeah, beginning of the 2000s, there were a couple of database systems. The only trick they played was change to column layout. So at the time, row layouts were popular. Some uh, systems changed to column layout, and that made a huge difference in, in performance for analytical queries. Yeah, the general rule is try to reduce the amount of data moved around in the storage hierarchy using compression, compression, appropriate domains, the data layout, stuff like that. And here again, the trade-offs of the different layouts. Um, yeah, we also men briefly mentioned these um, hybrid layouts beyond packs, so column grouping and vertical partitioning. Stay away from that if someone claims that that is useful. Uh, 
you can directly say, no, that's not true. Or in very, very rare case, cases, it's not worth uh, implementing it, I would claim. Yeah, and uh, as a practitioner, also consider domain encoding and lightweight compression techniques are typically very useful. More heavyweight compression, there you should be careful. So if your compression and decompression algorithms are really, really expensive, uh, it really depends on your configuration, on your machine, on your data, whether that makes sense. Yeah, with that, um, maybe let's ask our colleague. So what are the most important, and I just copy the important things um, computer scientist students and uh, computer scientists should know about data layouts in a database system. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, we had that effect in, in some of our exams. Yeah? So we ask a question, and uh, the student replies all kinds of stuff. However, it's not related to the question, just to, to write something, right? Um, uh, let's extend that. So it access a small number of columns for a large number of rows. That's actually not so much, right? <laughs> yeah, that's more a column layout thing. Few columns, large number of rows, more in favor of a column layout. So ha, ha, be careful, huh? In the column orientation, each column of data in the table is stored as a separate structure on disk and always for a given column are stored together. This layout specifies transactions that access Ah, so both of it is transactions. Ah, it's a query. So here, transaction, transaction and query is the same thing for for ChatGPT. As for the next, it's a large number of columns for small number. No, it's the opposite around. Hey, column number. What? No, <laughs> a large number of columns. No, a few number of columns. For this, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, right. So here, you see my see the problem. Yeah. Both of them have our own advantage in this one. For example, row and layout. So let's klug scheiß. Let's be a wise guy. Accurate, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, the problem is that the examples on the web where people uh, wrote bullshit. They said, "Okay, um, you're wrong. It should be ha ha ha." But actually, that was wrong, and then would accept, and then ChatGPT would accept that, even though it was wrong, even though it was right in the first place, and the human was wrong. Yeah, so that's kind of a bug. Uh, but anyway, uh, never mind. Okay, so let's continue with our slides. Anything? Yeah, later on. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to section three. So here we looked at indexing. Um, 
And, and then, of course, if you talk about indexing in the database system, you want to talk about B trees. We looked at at length, and it's really a super flexible structure you can use to build upon stuff. It's storage friendly, maps super well to the storage hierarchy, be it pages in main memory or cache lines um, in your storage hierarchy. It has a good trade-off with respect to random and sequential access, and it's super universal. Yeah? You can extend it in a zillion ways. It's really this algorithm. You have a fancy indexing problem. Did you try a B tree or a variant of it? Didn't work. Did you try really hard? So you can typically map any kind of indexing problem to a B tree underneath. Yeah, so we looked at these uh, node and leaf definitions. I don't want to look, uh, go into detail, but it's important uh, you keep them apart. Um, the B tree properties you should know about. So the, it's balanced with respect to pages. Yeah? So the pass from a root to any leaf has the same length. These K and K star, uh, so the, the number of um, uh, pivot elements are implicitly defined by data types and node size, obviously. Yeah, you always have a, this is this invariant that there's a page size. You map the node and the leaf to a, to a page, so that, that, that's a boundary. You can't go beyond that, so that defines everything else. You have no values in index nodes. Uh, all data sits in leaf nodes, and that's, in particular, that's important for this ISIN property. Um, and data inside nodes and leaves is sorted by key. Yeah, to allow for range queries. And also, to, I mean, to, to even to do the binary search you do in that tree. So one important property is this in interval partitioning. So basically, each node partitions the tree underneath into horizontal partitions with respect to the key being used. Yeah? So if you have a node like this with two pivot elements, 60 and 123, yeah, so th there's this subtree that may only contain data from minus infinity to 60 excluding. There's this subtree including only data from 60 to 123. And there's this one for everything 123 including and above. Yeah, and that happens recursively. Yeah, you can do the same thing here and then reason about the data contained in those subtrees. And that is important. As we have seen, I had some extended slides on that at the time when we discussed that when, when doing the splits and the merge, the things that may happen. Have to, you have to be careful. Yeah, find key, uh, so a point query is another term for that. Is um, yeah, how do you look up data? Basically, in every node, you find the appropriate subtree. So basically, the interval that may cover the key you're looking for, and that is this interval, is you, in this case, you only have two levels. You immediately hit this leaf. Inside the leaf, if the entries are sorted, you can do the standard binary search and then you find the entry if it exists or not, if it doesn't exist. Yeah, the index se sequential access method converts this tree into a graph. Yeah? Then you can basically do this range query that uh, is uh, split into a point query on the start of the interval. So you look for 34 and then you scan across the leaves, which are concatenated uh, by pointers until you hit a key that is strictly greater than the right, uh, than the, um, yeah, than, than the stop, than the 72 in this example, so the end of your interval. And that means you identified the, uh, the results you were looking for like that. That's ISIM. We looked at the B-tree operations. We looked at the insert operation. In particular, we also looked at leaf splits, how that is performed. So a split never changes the height of the tree except when you split the root node of the tree. Yeah, that's the important property we looked at. That's the only way how a tree can grow that is when splitting the root. Yeah? Other than that, it will only add a, an additional node to that spe specific layer where the uh, split occurred. Yeah, I think we can jump over them. Yeah, then important in practice is the different variants of um, how B-trees are used. So you can use it as a clustered index. That's typically done for a key and a relation. Many database systems create a clustered index on the primary key. And that means that the data on the store is in the same order as the entries on the leaf level. You see it with the arrows here. They don't go crisscross. They're all in parallel, in contrast. In an unclustered index, the arrows go crisscross. 
And that also means that typically you have one clustered index per relation and multiple unclustered indexes because the sort order yeah, works typically only for one of the attributes. And it also, it's also important um, because if you look up an unclustered index, you frequently, you easily ru uh, run into random IO problems. Yeah? And that may be a problem. We saw that in query processing if the cost optimization uh, gets it wrong. Yeah, so this is a dense index. Dense index means you have an entry for each row appearing in the tuple. You have an entry in the index. However, you can also make, create a sparse index, which means here in this example, you only have an entry for each page. Yeah, that is enough. Yeah, you know, once you find the page inside the page, you can easily search the tuple that you're looking for, and then you find out whether it exists or not. So the difference of dense and spark being on the leaf level, you can directly decide whether the key exists or not. That's a big advantage of a dense index, but of course you need way more space. Yeah? You don't need to look up the store to find out whether the index exists. Um, and that's different here. Yeah? Here you need to really go to the uh, data pages. Yeah, we talked about memory efficient indexes. So this variant, there are many names for that. One is a CSS tree, CSS tree that's what I showed, cache uh, sensitive structure, I think is the name. Uh, basically, we get rid of all of the pointers at the price of not being um, able to easily change the structure of the tree anymore. We talked about bulk loading, so sort the entries and then do this level-wise from left to right, bottom up. Bulk load creation, be sure that whatever you do with that uh, is a correct B tree. Yeah? Be careful because it has to be complete and you have to have the right number of parents and stuff like that. Uh, right number of children. Yeah. So here's the summary. B trees are awesome, they're everywhere, work well across all layers of the storage hierarchy, can easily be adapted to handle many different types of data inquiries. And they're still being extended and reinvented in 2023, of course. Okay, um, yeah, with that, let's ask our colleague again. What is the most important data? structure in a database system. Boom. Oh, come on. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually correct. Yeah, it's super important. Heaps, yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Jason, sure. Not bad, not bad. Okay, okay, okay. Cool, not bad. Um, any other question? Any idea? Um, should, should we ask him? Thank you. Um, I'm glad. Okay. How do you perform a split in a B tree? Ah, now you have to think, huh? Mm -hmm. We also had that split into really separate, uh, separate, so you have an insert making a leaf over, uh, overflow to separate the two things, yeah? the reason for the split and the split itself. No, it's <coughs> Not order, uh, okay, the device keys. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> Not bad. Okay.
Wow. It understands that if the parent overflows, yeah. No, 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 come on. No, 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 five is crap. Yeah, we can do that e more easy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, true, true. A full node into two sub. Yeah, 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 that. Okay. Yeah, good. Got it. Okay. Shut up. <laughs> Stop generating. Okay. Um, the one thing, one pun, of course, was the reflection of the prandial mass. This was the very thing. What was that? To reflect. That's a rhetorical pun. If you don't, if you're unsure about details, then say you do something to reflect that change rather than say, yeah, I do this and that and this and that and this and that. Right. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's need to fix that. All right, so. Um, with that, we enter section four. Um, so that was the second part of indexing. So we looked at, looked at bitmap indexes. So if you ever worked with pandas and, and Python, uh, you've seen bit lists and bitmaps. So just for the uh, terminology again, the entire thing is a bitmap and it consists of three bit lists. Yeah? Because, why three? Because we only have three different values in the original column. Yeah? So for each distinct value that occurs here, you create one bit list, one for New York, one for Cupertino, one for Berlin, and then the semantics is this, is the value equal or not? If it's equal, it's true, if not, it's false. That's an uncompressed, simple bitmap. And um, yeah, then the variance of that one is to decompose a bitmap. So decomposes in particularly, it's, uh, it's very helpful if you have many different values occurring. Yeah? There's still some redundancy, but they're many different, and you don't need, need that many bit lists. Can be useful in practice. Range encoded bitmap, you have an example here. It's range encoded bitmap just changes the condition from equality. Yeah? So if we go back here on the slide, yeah? This is, is the value equal? In the range encoded bitmap, the condition is, is the value smaller equal whatever? Yeah, that is the condition we had. And with that, you can do range lookups and point lookups uh, efficiently, just doing the logical uh, combinations. Yeah? So those are very useful things you can use in practice. Yeah, Bloom filter is super important as a pre-filter algorithm. You, you see it everywhere, networks, computer systems, database systems, uh, all kinds of... Um, subfields of computer science use that. And the idea is um, that um, it's very similar to a hash table. However, you, the hash table here doesn't contain the data. The hash table is just a bit list, yeah? having um, a number of bit sets. So you have capital M number of bits from zero to M minus one, capital M minus one. Each bucket just contains a Boolean flag, so one bit. And then you have a set of hash functions, K hash functions in that, ca that case. And the idea is to insert, which actually means to mark the bit at the Bloom filter that you consider that element. You um, hash it uh, through the three hash functions. So hash function one returns bucket 12, the modulo number of m, I suppose, here, of course. And then you set this to true, this to true, and this to true. And you do that, uh, can do that for as many inserts as you want. Um, and you will have collisions, of course. But then it's important that you have these interesting Bloom filter semantics that is, okay, now to understand whether a specific key was marked in the Bloom filter, you do the same thing as before, not setting the bit in the bucket, but che checking um, um, whether the bit is set. So the semantics is really for what, um, if one of the hash fun functions for that specific key is zero, that implies it cannot have been inserted, no way, because that would have been true. If all of the bits are set for that specific key, that implies that it may have been marked. Yeah? So that's the probabilistic part in that structure um, that, that's important here. So it's not a guarantee that it was inserted because 
The bit flips could have happened uh, due to other um, inserts, but it could be. Uh, so this index is not um, a good idea to understand precisely whether an element is there. This, is, um, this, this index is also called a filtering index, a filter index yeah, to determine, okay, I know it could have been there, so what's next? Yeah? So the next step could be a B tree, for instance. You could avoid expensive lookups, or relatively expensive lookups in the B tree or any other structure by first asking the bloom filter. If the bloom filter says, yeah, it could be there, then you ask the B tree, but you only pay, uh, then you pay only a few times the price rather than every time looking up the uh, B tree uh, or whatever structure you use. Yeah, yeah so I uh, basically explained that. You may have false positives, of course. Uh, yeah, so summary here is it's a very useful technique to evaluate wear conditions. It's space efficient. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, just this array of bits. It's peanuts. Could also be compressed additionally if you want it. Um, so it's approximate, probabilistic, but tunable for many scenarios, yeah, in particular by setting the right size and by setting the number of hash functions. We had an exercise on that. We also discussed that in the lab. Yeah. So we also looked at the different definitions of point queries, range queries. I don't go through all the details. Yeah, that that's basically was a precursor to what we later looked at in query optimization. So you have a filter condition. How do you evaluate such filter? Well, there are basically only two options. One is to brute force, meaning you scan the relation. You inspect each tuple one by one. And for each tuple, you can decide whether it fulfills the search predicate or not. Or you have something like an index, yeah, pointing you directly to the qualifying tuples, yeah, reducing the size of the search, spa search space in meaningful ways. So, um, yeah, so let me just, I think we don't going to go that in detail, but basically, uh, so those slides, and I think they're conceptually interesting and important, is really to, to, to hammer into your head that, yeah, it's all about horizontal partitioning and those implied uh, partitioning functions. That's all you ever need to know. That's what, what every index in the world is doing. It's horizontally partitioning the data, sometimes with replication, sometimes without. But concept conceptually, that's all what you're doing. And once you understand that, then you can do these rewrites. Yeah? So if you have a query like this, selecting all tuples from R where B equals this capital C character, well, then you can rewrite that to a partition that only contains um, the ones were um, as a equals zero, a modulo two equals zero. Yeah, in this case, yeah. So there was already this there was two partitioning functions. The example, yeah. But basically, you partition your data, and then the index just um, inspects a subset a subset of that horizontal of those horizontal partitions for query processing. Yeah, that's the entire trick that all indexes play. Yeah, then you can do that for one-dimensional range queries, for multi-dimensional range queries, blah blah blah, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so what should we ask um, ChatGPT about that? I had a question when we talked about bloom filters. Hmm. When would a bloom filter be useful? And if you have other ideas for questions, you can also Set membership, yeah, those are all applications of set membership. Actually, this is correct. So, all good. Okay, any other question? It gets more interesting if you, I mean, I try to paste uh, concrete assignments. That's not so, <laughs> that doesn't, didn't work out so well for ChatGPT, right? Yeah, so that always has this high level thing, but, but then if it goes with concrete numbers, the interesting thing that happens then is, um, so, it gets the first answers right, yeah, and everything that follows looks, the structure really looks right, but, but it's not correct, yeah, but, but the structure it gets right, how the, 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 the over, if you like go 10 meters away from, from the skin, yeah, yeah, the, the structure looks right, but if you look at the numbers, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So it hallucinates uh, a solution, 
and parts of it may be correct and parts not. Yeah. So here's another variant. So there are many ChatGPT alternatives you might have seen, and this is u.com. Fun fact, this was created by a guy who did his master's at Saarland University. Yeah, Richard, so Richard Socherer, something like that's now a big uh, shot in AI. And this is something like well, how the future of uh, search may look like. Yeah? You get this generated answer plus a number of real citations pointing you to, to for you to, to look at. Yeah? So check it out, also pretty interesting. But let's uh, stick with ChatGPT and let's look at chapter five. So how to compute complex queries at scale. So yeah, I showed this uh, period table or period system element in, in German. So this uh, the elements of relational algebra that are important in the bottom line um, to understand here was, okay, selection is about indexing, projection, projecting could be about column layouts or is often about column layouts. Everything else is about join algorithms or variants thereof. Yeah? So join algorithms can basically do all the heavy lifting for these operators. Yeah, and uh, then we looked at, looked at these different classical classes, nested loop, index nested loop, including hash, sort merge, and partitioning algorithms, in, in particular co-partitioning algorithms. So nested loop is really like the programming equivalent of doing the cross product and then filtering out the results of the cross product afterwards. So you run two loops, yeah, one for input R, the other for input S, and then for each tuple, you um, check whether it fulfills the joint predicate. If so, you output it to the result. Yeah, that is an algorithm that works in all cases, however, it has square complexity, so it's not really efficient. Yeah, then you can improve upon that easily by doing index nested loop join. So an index nested loop join is typically done by an index and a suitable index already exists. Yeah, so you need an index that's uh, able to answer point queries on one of the attributes found in the join condition. So, so if the index was built on r.x as a key and that happens to occur in the join predicate, well, uh, then you have an index you can use. Yeah, then basically you kill one of the loops, just loop over the other relation and use that as a lookup into the index for r.x. Yeah? With that you can determine the matching queries, the matching tuples of r. Yeah? So which tuples of r have this key? Yeah? And you do that for each tuple from s yeah? and then you get the query result. An important variant of that is simple hash join. Uh, independent, uh, we can go to the next slide already. No, I don't have it here. So independent of whether that index exists or not, you can also build it on the fly, typically on the left input. And then the index you use is typically a hash table. That's the most efficient thing to do in main memory. But basically a simple hash join is just a variant of an index nested loop join. Yeah, I've looked at sort merge join. You sort both inputs of so one of the inputs is sorted or both of them, you merge them yeah, in, in the zip style algorithm. And we looked at co-grouping. That is an um, important algorithm. Here again, there's a, the slides I showed to you at this time. Basically, he uses the same partitioning function for both inputs. Yeah, and you uh, partition the input here in this example into seven partitions, horizontal partitions again, using, uh, uh, you don't need much memory for that. So here in this example, if it's seven partitions, you need seven plus one pages. Yes? One output page for each uh, buffer, one input page for the input data. And that would be enough in theory to partition the data. And you do the same for the S input. Yeah. And then what you can do is you can, uh, yeah, you reduce the problem to smaller joints. Yeah? Now you can join those partitions one by one. So this is called a core group or a core partition, which has the interesting property. If you partition it right, that join results can only be found within, within such a core group but not across there. Yeah? R, R0 cannot have join results with any of those partitions. Yeah, so if you partition both such that you will only end up with uh, join results in the same core group, you reduce it to a smaller problem. Yeah, and then as long as one of those inputs fits into main memory, you can use simple hash join, for instance. You could also use sort merge join on the core group, doesn't matter, but uh, simple hash join don't uh, be blinded by, it has to be the left input has to be where you build the hash table, it can be any of those inputs. Yeah? If any of the inputs fits into main memory, you can uh, run simple hash join. 
Yeah, and if, if both are still too big after partitioning, well, you could repartition. Yeah, that's another approach you could do. You recurse. Yeah, I think that's basically, we can jump over that. Yeah, grouping and aggregation, same algorithms. Um, yeah, if it's a standard group by, well, it's the same algorithm as a cool group join, of course, yeah, just with one input rather than two. Be sure to understand that grouping and aggregation is two different things. Again, group by is three operators. First, grouping, in other words, partitioning horizontally into groups. On each horizontal partition, you do an aggregation. And then for that uh, aggregation, you also do a projection. Yeah, that's how group by works, algorithmically, but also conceptually. External merge sort we looked at. Um, how that works, very uh, important algorithm. You could, um, I think we can jump over the example here. So you have these run generation phases and the merge phases. Yeah, so basically run generation, if that is your input file with eight pages only, you first generate these sorted runs and then you merge them iteratively into a final run. We uh, discussed the different optimizations, so doing the online merge, we just discussed how to do early aggregation, aggregating, why merging, uh, these kind of things. And we discussed replacement selection. So this fancy algorithm allowing you to, to create runs that are, that are bigger than the available main memory. It's a very nice algorithm that you can find in Donald Knuth's books. Yeah, that's what we learned here, early grouping and aggregation I mentioned. So in summary, so we have these four principal paradigms of join algorithms. And you should really read those as algorithmic patterns. Yeah? You can, that can be used for other relational algebra operators like grouping, aggregation, blah, 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 and so forth. Yeah, for all of those, it's always very similar algorithms. Um, these external sorting and external partitioning algorithms, those really are important if it's the, in the big data domain, where big really means large data sets yeah, that don't fit on a single machine. You have a large cluster. Uh, well, then you end up sorting the stuff or partitioning the stuff. You shouldn't say partitioning these days. People will say, oh, I shuffle the data. Yeah, it was shuffled. It's the same thing, shuffle the data across the machines. But, but it's the same algorithms as explained here. And uh, there are also opportunities to fuse algorithms. So as shown with early aggregation, sorting and grouping and aggregation, early grouping and aggregation can be fused. And that, um, yeah, with that you, you get very interesting algorithms that are way more efficient than doing it one by one. First sorting and then grouping. Yeah? If you, you can sometimes choose them and it's way more efficient. Okay, so with that, let's ask our friend here. What should we ask? Any idea? Uh, there was an error generating. Where am I? Am I here? Hmm. Gone. Should I reload? Oh, I re <laughs> every, every time I hit reload, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I get this. Oh, we're too busy at the moment. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll get back to you. So, any question on um, query processing? What should we ask? Hmm. Wow, actually pretty good. Could, could be an encyclopedic article. Wow, <laughs> okay. Can, can, can we ask something where it really fails? Is someone an idea? <laughs> um. So maybe you also watched my videos. I'm not so sure. That's this is so good. <laughs> oh my god! I'm giving up, man. Wow. 
Awesome. Cool. Okay. Any other ideas? Isn't that frightening a little bit? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is frightening. Right? Uh, you should you, you watch out when, when programming gets better. But programming is already pretty good yeah? for um, this co-pilot, GitHub co-pilot. Anyway, so um, let's look at career optimization. So we d didn't look at rule-based optimization because uh, I assume that you have that in some undergrad lecture. Um, so we looked at cost-based optimization and one message is, okay, join order. Yeah? So if you have, have uh, the option, you, you sometimes have the option that you can choose your order how to perform the joins. Yeah? So you could first join C and B and then the result was A or for first A and C and then the result was B. And then you can reason about, okay, which is more efficient than the other. And then we talked about cost models. Here, cost model um, I used on this slide is okay, the number of intermediate tuples. So here you create 100,000 tuples, which are joined with 1,000 tuples on the left. And here it's only 100 tuples, which are joined with 1,000 tuples on the right. So you yeah, may reason, if you only reason across, um, along the lines of intermediate results, it may actually be a good idea to execute plan two. Yeah. And then basically we, we develop, uh, developed a lot of machinery to, um, to use that in a real algorithm. Um, and um, that is important also for access path selection. Access path meaning how do I retrieve data from my relations, be it a scan, be it whatever index. That's the access path to my data. And um, the query optimizer has to make a decision. Do I use the index or am I not going to use that index? Yeah? Do I use the data in a specific layout? That is what that's meant to be. Yeah? This is row layout, column layout. Maybe I have it in two different layouts and so forth and so forth, or there's an index. Yeah? So basically these relational algebra expressions, a selection on top of um, a relation can opt, some often, often be rewritten to an index yeah, in the physical plan. And uh, then you have to make a decision whether you actually use the index or whether you don't use the index. And then the problem, and that may sound trivial, if there's an index, you, you, you want to use it. But again, in particular on, on a slow um, storage medium like a hard disk, you may uh, run into this trap here on the right that actually an unclustered index may trigger a lot of random I.O. And um, if the query optimizer fails in, in making a right decision, yeah, so the decision would be if it's uh, that many results, you switch to scan because the scan will be faster than the actual index. Yeah, if you can make that decision, it's fine. But sometimes query optimizers fail yeah, and they would, for instance, yeah, for that many results, still use the index, and then the query is two or three times slower than using the scan in the first place. That may happen. Um, that's a problem. So it's, it's not a trivial choice to, to, to say, I use the index. If there's an index, I use the index. That can be terribly wrong in terms of performance. Yeah, then we looked at cost space optimization, of course, all the things that are entailed with that, plan enumeration, search space, the size of the search spaces, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah, overall idea is important, of course. You enumerate a set of all plan alternatives or use shortcuts when you can identify, oh, that plan I don't have to enumerate because it's already much more expensive than what I've seen before. But you try to exploit the entire search space if possible. You estimate the costs of such plans, yeah, of a large number of plans possibly, and then you pick the plan with the lowest estimated costs and then you go for it then that plan is executed by the database system. Yeah? So that's, that is what happens when you send a SQL query to a database system. Yeah? Many plan alter, alternatives are considered. One of those gets executed. And let's hope for the best that that actually is the fastest plan, the best plan. Yeah? The query optimizer can be wrong, of course. Yeah. yeah. yeah we, you, we introduced this terminology. So in particular, how do you get from a SQL statement to what we call the query graph or join graph. So for each relation mentioned in the from, you get a node in the graph. For each join condition mentioned here, like D joins, joins this B, that's this edge here, you get an edge. These thin edges basically represent cross products. Yeah? And we only looked at cases, uh, we basically said, okay, we will enumerate only along the join predicates. Interestingly, that doesn't necessarily lead to the optimal plan. You can actually sometimes find plans, plans that use cross products and are faster than those plans we generated. Yeah, that happens. 
but in the majority of cases, that's good enough. Yeah? So it's a, it's a trade-off in, in uh, developing query engines. Yeah? So you just you ignore cross products and just uh, enumerate plans along the edges you find in such a query graph. Yeah, you also annotate these, they're called sagable queries, which, which means those are uh, sagable uh, filters. Those are filters with, with respect to only one relation like those, yeah? You basically attach them here directly to, to the nodes and then, well, that's the query. That's basically, it's just missing the projection, uh, the information that you find in the select. So the projection is not represented here, but, but all the important things, well, you find it here in the query graph. So you can, st you can skip over all of that rule-based stuff you learned before and database systems did in the past. You can basically directly translate, oops, um, translate the query to such a joint query and that makes life much easier. Yeah, then we talked about dynamic programming and how that works with um, different examples. So one variant of the algorithm, assuming no interesting orders, not exploiting the graph structure, is basically enumerating all the subsets. Yeah? So you first start with subsets of size one, which means for each relation you, determine, you list the best the, the plans that are possible. Could be a scan, could be an, an index axis, uh, could be an ISIM index axis, and so forth and so forth. Yeah? And then you list all of those alternatives for accessing relation A, and you keep the best one with respect to your cost model. Yeah? So you have to have a cost model that gives you a, um, an estimate on that. Yeah, and then you're here, and then you uh, consider the iteration by considering all the sub-problems of size two. Yeah? So all sub-problems for two relations are joined. Uh, that's this one. And then of course, some of the, so like relation A and C, yeah, there's no real edge that could only be joined by cross product. Well, yeah, then you can make the decision, okay, I don't enumerate them for instance, because that would be too expensive. Yeah? But in either way, you just keep again the best plans of um, size two and so forth until eventually you end up with uh, plans of size three and from that you can create plans of size four which is equivalent to the original query which is a problem of size four. Yeah, that is dynamic programming or one variant of that. And then there are many tricks you can play. So one important trick is uh, to consider the graph, yeah, to not just blindly um, enumerate all of the possible options and then check whether there's an edge, but uh, really take the graph and enumerate sub-problems along the graph. Yeah? So it's a, uh, the algorithm says do exactly that. So the summary for query optimization is cost-based optimization is a key technique for large or complex queries. So if you have a key value store-like access, if you have transactions doing inserts, updates, delete, Possibly, maybe a cost-based optimizer won't help too much. Yeah? But for, for large analytical queries, typically there's no way around uh, using cost-based optimization. It's important to not force SQL into relational algebra too early, as we do it in the undergrad lecture, because that's the classical way of doing it. You also see it in many textbooks. Uh, but the problem with that is it loses information because it's yet another translation uh, where information gets lost and it's actually not required to use relational algebra at that point. It also creates a bunch of artificial problems like rule-based rewrites on logical operators. You don't need that actually. Always start by translating the SQL query into a join graph. That is the way to go. And then enumerate along the graph, also enumerating physical operators. Um, I mean, there are many ways of doing that. Uh, you might have seen immutable. We first determine the join order on the logical graph and then there's a one-to-one -one, um, uh, translation to a physical, um, um, physical plan. Yeah, that's another way of doing that. You could also enumerate physical alternatives in query enumer enumeration, um, but that again, um, yeah, blows up the search space considerably. Okay, so that is uh, I wanted to say about that. So still there. What should we ask? Up to you.
mean, it says it depends in, 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 in other ways. It's already pretty. <laughs> no, come on. Memorization. Uh, yeah. Labert mich voll hier. <laughs> Best friend of the. Yeah, this is kind of uh, talking. I mean, I was expecting a more scientific answer like TPCCP, for instance, but uh, anyway, no. Uh, what else can we ask? Um, what is a join graph? No, not the order. <laughs> yeah, it's mixing up plans with graphs, kind of, right? Including the order in which table. No. Yeah, that, that's why when we look at the query plans, this binary plan, yeah, join these two relations, and then the result was that, stuff like that. So that's mixing it up. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Can you uh, see some example where the first product would be a better solution than the third? Like mm. It happens in analytical databases for, for fact tables. There was many small dimension tables. Where you first cross product the dimension tables. Assume it, um, a dimension table with two tuples and the other with two tuples rather than first joining the two tuples with a fact table across that um, foreign key and the other with a fact table, you first cross product the two into four tuples and then do the join. So that's the kind of scenario. Uh, can you give me an example where a uh, physical plan with a cross product is faster than a plan only using joins? Wow, that's correct. That's very selective. No, it's not even false from one of those tables in the closet. Not bad. It's kind of different. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think ne <laughs> next winter term, ChatGPT is giving the lecture alone. Uh, uh, let's make sure the president doesn't uh, learn about that. Okay, so with that, so where are we? Oh yeah, so query execution, right. So half an hour to go, a bit. Uh, Slow. Okay. Anyway, I'm slow. I'm not slow, right? So query execution models, function calls, versus pipelining. I will jump over some of the slides, but basically, we look at the different pipelining models we had in the lecture. Um, so how to execute that, and then you can think along. Uh, so if you have a plan like that that determines the join order, so now we have a query plan along uh, things. Um, so sources and sinks. So this is a source of data and this is a sink. Yeah? If that, that were a hash table, for instance, it's a simple hash join. So here, the sink, uh, in the sense that you build a hash table on the data that's flowing along the pipeline. And then you can reason uh, along those. You can reason about, okay, how does the data flow in such a plan? Um, yeah, basically, that's what I explained. And we thought about pipeline breakers. So in a simple hash join, you first have to consume all of the left input to build the hash table. And it's like uh, as if all the, the water flew into this operator. So you have a large water tank, which must be big enough to uh, accumulate all of the water that comes from that pipeline. Sorting is the same thing. It's breaking the pipeline because there's no way you can yield the first let's say the smallest element in the sorted sequence without first consuming all of the data. 
unless you can make other assumptions. Yeah? If you know there's no further small element coming from underneath than whatever, 42, if, there's for, if you had statistics, and statistics show you know everything that follows is strictly bigger than 42, a little bit like in replacement selection, actually, yeah, then, then you can play tricks. But if you don't know that, well, then you have to accumulate first all of that. Uh, yeah, and then you have these building blocks that you can use to build the pipelines. We talked about that at length. Um, and um, basically, the major difference is then a pull-based versus a push-based implementation. So pull-based is something like iterator style. You have a next method returning an element, whether in, in push-based, uh, that's more frequently used in memory systems, is uh, also next call, but where you pass the element to the next operator. Yeah, so that's the, the difference here is that the element is passed to the next uh, um, operator, whereas in a pull-based world, the next element returns the next element. Yeah? And then you can reason about, okay, who is pulling who and who is pushing who and so forth. Yeah? But those are the two paradigms you find in those worlds. Yeah, we also looked at memory crossing and jump over that. Yeah, those were pipelines and the different elements. It's a much longer story, of course. We, we spent more than an hour on that. And then we looked at uh, another extension, basically, basically an extension to relation algebra called anti-projecting. And that's the inverse of a normal projection. And that, that matters if you worry about, okay, how do I actually um, project my final output data? Yeah? If, if in the select statement, there's a list of columns you want to show, how do you create that anyway? In a row-based system, it's typically you, you collect those attribute values early on. But in the column store, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah? So uh, the question here is not when to narrow a tuple. That is what a normal projection does, yeah? maybe getting down from ABC to AB. Here the question is when to widen the tuple, yeah? getting from AB to ABC. And then we looked at different uh, query plans um, that do that, different strategies. So the standard strategy is early materialization. So Whenever you touch a relation, you already collect all the attributes that are requested in the select. Versus late materialization, here you do this query processing only on the attribute values that are required to determine the tuples that qualify. And later on, you attach uh, attributes that should be displayed uh, as the last step. And that's a technique that may pay off in a column store. Not the first thing you implement, but for some situations, it may pay off. Yeah. So the summary here of part two was, you should uh, be aware of the blocking behavior of certain operations. So that's a principal problem, uh, hard to get around that. You should be careful with memory requirements, in particular if operators need to collect, need to buffer like all of the inputs from underneath. There are these two paradigms, push versus pull, that are used in systems. Again, pull is more in the disk-oriented world and push is more in the main memory world. Uh, one thing you should use is to try to use batches. Yeah? So often query plans are explained along the lines, aha, then one tuple is pushed or one tuple is pulled, where you can push or pull k tuples at a time. It's way more efficient. There are very weird names uh, about that. One term I particularly dislike is vectorization, but it's the same thing. It's batching tuples, and it's widely used, and I don't like it. But I just mentioned it here because it's nothing but batching tuples, yeah, or batching multiple values of a column. Hey, yeah, that's batching. It's, maybe, yeah, it looks like a vector, but hey, come on, it's batching. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you should uh, seek the best trade-off, of course, here. Yeah, so, query processing. What should I ask? Come on, you can't know. Do you know the difference between a projection and an anti? I mean, the question now gives the answer kind of away. Huh? Uh, let's see.
Wow. I I'm so sure you watched my video, sir. Uh, <laughs> when it writes S N A I, <laughs> you already know the rest, right? But this anti-projection is very specific, yeah? So, I mean, maybe I kind of gave it away in the answer, right? I mean, if it's projection, then you can actually hallucinate what an anti-projection is, kind of. I should have asked differently. Uh, any other question? What else do we have? It can't, no tuple reconstruction, no. What is, what is tuple reconstruction? Nah, nah. Okay, can be, sure. So we got something. Not very precise, but also not wrong, I would say. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Let's see what happens two years from now, right? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> really insane. Okay. Um, so, acid, hey, acid. Okay, I oh, know, no, that was this no, uh, no lecture, this Christmas lecture where um, trapped you into uh, saying that all of, some of these are made up and some are not, but actually they all existed. So, the, so if in doubt in database, there will be a fancy research project that tried some fancy idea. Yeah? And that makes this field interesting. Um, yeah, because there's so many fancy, non-standard, out-of-the-box thinking ideas you can follow, and that's really fun. Anyway, yeah, so... Um, oh yeah, then, then we did this um, uh, reaction video, on Andy Pavlov's video. If you haven't seen that yet, uh, uh, check it out. So basically, we looked at analytical query processing, and in particular in the lab, we looked at these semi-join reducers, yeah? So where you play the idea that you reduce, you want to join tables, one sits on one node, the other table sits on the other node, and then you can reduce the amount of data that has to be shipped by uh, executing a semi-join on one of the sites. So it's a, called a semi-join reducer. That's a very neat trick, and then basically, um, the takeaway message from the assignment sheet, it was, was showing you like three times the same exercise with, with a little constants uh, exchanged. It's, well, it doesn't matter if it's across machines in a data center, across data centers, across NUMA regions, it's going to be the same algorithm that you can use to reduce uh, bandwidth. So that was the takeaway message. So semi joins to the rescue. It's really, really an important um, trick you can play in an analytical database. And the second takeaway message, of course, was, well, all of that can be mapped to a generalized core group join. Yeah, generalized core group join partitions on both. And then the interesting question is when the join is coming in and you want to execute the join on your distributed system, well, is, are both relations already partitioned on the join key or not? If not, well, you have to partition the other one. Maybe you have to partition both. If you're lucky, both are already co-partitioned. But basically, what you're doing is a co-partition join. Yeah, then Aries recovery. Uh, so we looked about logging, stable storage, and write-ahead logging, very important, write-ahead logging. So we have, again, the split layer where there's a store and stable storage. So typically, a very fast hard disk that can do very fast sequential writes. You can also use an SSD, of course. Um, for that, and uh, yeah, this is really important slide yeah, because that that gets wrong often. So the the log is the database. That's a very important sentence. I mean, yesterday the discussion we, uh, in the project uh, we are doing, uh, writing a Django application. So there was a guy questioning whether there might be truth outside the database. 
but which doesn't make any sense, right? The database is the truth, at least for a computer scientist, yeah? But even, even more true than the database store is the lock. Yeah, the lock is everything that counts. The store is just an optimized version of the lock. Yeah? Yeah? You can run a database just using the lock. We, we actually had the research pro project uh, 10 years ago where we tried to do that just using a lock. Yeah? And it makes a lot of sense in particular if you think about streaming systems because a stream is nothing but a lock sent over a wire. Yeah? But anyway, yeah, so that's a very important uh, yeah, thing to understand about databases. Yeah, it can be read and written sequentially. Your fast replay, IO-wise at least, provides versioning. <clears throat> so many systems allow you to do something like that as of. <clears throat> I think Oracle, in Oracle you can do that and some other expensive systems. Select whatever, whatever, from whatever, whatever, as of a certain time. Yeah? Like in, in Git, yeah? you can request a certain version. It's a natural extension point for distributed databases. Yeah? If you wrote a log record on your particular system, in, in one server on your distributed system, to, to inform the others about that change, you simply ship the log records to the other systems. That's called log shipping. Yeah? Rather than executing something on the other servers, you just ship whatever log records you create to the other system. Then the other system simply applies, um, sorry, appends those log records to its log. That's it. If the, system, the other system has time for it, it can also execute the log on its store. That's fine. Yeah? But it's important that it uh, appends it to its log. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and this is technically, uh, this, or there's overlap with what people call ledgers in blockchain systems, but uh, yeah, that's another story. Same thing. Okay, so write ahead logging, super, 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 super important uh, message. Whatever you do, you first write, you, you first persist to uh, stable storage. You first write to the log, then you change in the store. Yeah? I, I showed to you this variant where you modified a memory in the database store and then wrote it down. That's, uh, uh, so no, you first modified the store, um, then you wrote it to the log file, and then you wrote it to the database store. That's all fine. Yeah? So write ahead logging is important when it comes to persisting the data. First persisting it in the log and then persisting it uh, in the file that represents data from the database store. Yeah, that's the important thing. So it's written again on that summary slide. So when committing a transaction, you first force the log entry to disk, and that also entails all other log entries uh, that may still sit in the, in the buffer. So everything uh, up to and including this log record uh, is persisted. Then you write the changed page to the disk store. That is very important. And that also has its implication for dirty pages. Yeah, you can't just evict dirty pages from the database buffer. Yeah, you first have to make sure that you force all corresponding log entries to disk. Otherwise, you would be violating the, uh, the write ahead logging principle. That's very important. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, another way of seeing that is the version in the log is always younger or equal the version in the persisted store yeah, on disk. That is write ahead logging. Yeah, we, we talked about different variants of physical and logical logging. I um, have to skip a few slides. I think we had that at length. And then we looked at ARIES, of course, this important algorithm for uh, database recovery. We looked at the different phases, so three phases. First, analysis, then redo, and then undo. Um, Analysis determines the point in time where you start the redo phase and analysis reconstructs transaction table and dirty page table. So then in redo, you um, try to reconstruct the database state as of the crash. So once you're here, you, you reconstructed the, the database state as of the crash, and then you do one final pass backwards where you remove changes done by the loser transactions. Yeah, that also includes this important principle in redo. You redo everything you find, including the actions from loser transactions. Yeah. So that's called the repeating history uh, paradigm. Yeah, then we looked at the different structures. You should know about that. There's probably going to be a question about that in the exam. Also fuzzy checkpoints, of course. So fuzzy checkpoint is just writing out the dirty page table and the transaction table. We had this, um, this variant where you have it in two 
with two separate checkpoints. So the begin checkpoint marking the point in time and this uh, last checkpoint, uh, do you have an example? You know, I don't have it here, but it actually contains those tables. Yeah, summary is this. Logging actions to a persistent medium is a cornerstone for crash recovery. Aries is a state-of-the-art method. It's beautiful, flexible, and it's a building block for efficient recovery and high availability, and so forth and so forth. I think I mentioned all of that. Okay, so. Well, I'm not a specialist on, I don't know, <laughs> is it good or bad? <laughs> okay. I mean, you can also do this, uh, write a summary slide explaining areas crash recovery, recovery using LaTeX Beamer. <laughs> That's not what I did, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it did it before. I did it already. I created latex slides. I tried it out before. <laughs> and then, no, 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 I didn't. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever. We don't have time for that. Okay, let's do. So, you want to see? I mean, that can be copied from, from a paper, right? It doesn't have to think about that. But that's the interesting question. Is that text generated from the AI? Or is it a paragraph taken from a paper, from a, from a book, or something like that? I don't know. It would be nice if they could mark it somehow. Yeah? But what is the, the source for that? Is a, a citation, like, like in the other search engine? Yeah? Um, I want to know. <laughs> okay, but it's just some text wrapped. Okay. Uh, I tried it the other day for some stuff. I think uh, I asked to do an introductory talk on blah, blah, blah. I created like five or six slides actually in LaTeX Beamer. I didn't compile it, didn't try it, but looked uh, plausible. Right? Not this one, but, but ChatGPT did it. So why? I'm not sure. Maybe it's a new version. They can't. Uh, 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 unlearned uh, LaTeX, whatever. Okay, so in the interest of time, so which one should I do? Elasticity or MVCC? Who wants to recap elasticity? Who wants to do MVCC? Come on, raise of hands. So we have two chapters left, but only time for one. I should ne do neither of those. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'm fine with that. So, who wants to do um, um, elasticity as a service? Raise your hands now. One, two, three, four. Who wants to do MVCC? Yeah. The letter is less. Uh, is much more. Much boring. Okay. Anyway, elasticity is so much more interesting than one. Yeah, MVCC. Okay. <clears throat> so what can I say about MVCC? So Cornerstone is versioning the database. And I showed to you many examples how to version a database, in particular through playing tricks, tricks with virtual memory, yeah? using the snapshotting properties either through fork or through a technique called rewiring or even modifying the operating system. That's one way of doing that. We looked at something, and that's also used by Postgres, that is having different copies of the rows of the two builds in the database yeah, in different versions, row-wise versions. Yeah, and we have this slide, and then you can see that basically the key, the original key, is extended 
Uh, in a hidden column, in Postgres, the columns are called x min and x max, and you can actually um, select them, um, marking the versions. So this tuple is valid from transaction five to infinity, and this version is not valid yet. Uh, so there's extra information. Uh, so here's only one transaction. It's clear that must be transaction nine working on that. But basically, the transactions are, that are currently creating versions don't write anything uh, in those intervals. Methods differ. Some methods write something there, others don't. Anyway, messages, you can do this in a way that you can completely uh, remove um, the undo phase from Aries. You don't have to undo any stuff. You can all, uh, fix possible dirty entries in your store on the way when you run into them. You don't have to undo stuff anymore because you don't ruin the original entry. Yeah, if you have an update in place semantics in a store and really changed the thing and then the transaction crashes, well, then you have a problem because you have to go back to the consistent version. Here, that doesn't happen because the data, the actual payload, well, let's, let's look at this one, uh, the actual payload, which is different here, you have 51 and now the new uh, value is 42, this is never modified. Uh, so the algorithm, algorithms may modify the metadata on the way, but that doesn't hurt. You can construct the algorithms that you're still possible, it's still possible to, to completely skip the undo phase yeah, and clean up in different ways. Yeah? So that's an um, interaction with uh, the recovery algorithms. Yeah, and then we looked at a specific MVCC variant. There are many of those. Um, the basic, basic idea is it runs in three phases. So you first simulate what the transaction is doing. And simulate means you, you update changes on new um, versions of those tuples. Yeah? If you want to update a tuple, that means you, you insert a new tuple with the same value as the old. And then you do the changes, but you never touch the old tuple, never touch the data of the old tuple. So you don't ruin the consistent state. And um, you also always see a consistent snapshot of the data as of the time the transaction starts. It's called snapshot isolation. So transaction one sees the data as of the time when it started T2 as well. Yeah, so even though data is modified in this example concurrently, you still see the same value as of the time in the version when the transaction started. Yeah? So you always see the consistent snapshots. So the repeatable read pr problem goes away and part of the phantom problematic uh, also goes away with that. Yeah, and th then basically the algorithm, algorithmic idea in this variant is <clears throat> um, happens then in the second phase. So after, if you wanna commit, you enter the validation phase for, e for each transaction and then you intersect the right set with all right sets of committed transactions, transactions that committed at the time while you were running. So whenever you do something in a transaction, you keep a set of the elements you touched or you, you wrote in this uh, scenario. So you wrote A, yeah? This transaction also wrote A, you intersect. The intersect is not non-empty. You abort this transaction T1, yeah? If, you, if the intersection is empty, only then you're allowed to proceed to the commit phase. And then you can switch those versions in your store. Yeah, then you can do what we saw here in that table. Yeah, then you fiddle with the metadata such this newly created tuple now becomes the valid tuple. And the old tuple is the outdated tuple, which can eventually be removed. And one important thing in this multi-version concurrency um, control algorithm is other transactions may still be working on older snapshots to read it. That is okay. Yeah? Read only queries, don't block writing queries. Yeah? So the writing queries uh, create new versions of the tuple while the others are still reading. In a store where you had only one version, yeah, everyone would be blocking everyone else. You can't write to a tuple if, if someone is reading. It's, uh, it's impossible due to the lock matrix we've had in the undergrad lecture. But here, you separate readers and writers. Readers can operate while someone is writing a new version of the tuple. And that's a very important concurren uh, concurrency feature uh, of MVCC. Yeah. yeah, then you commit and then you have to have a mechanism through some sort of locking typically to uh, make sure that your version becomes a new version. Yeah, that's the core idea of the algorithm. And then you uh, find out that yeah, there's uh, one 
problem you may run into, and that's called write skew anomaly. So um, that's a situation like that, where you write to different values, however, read uh, the same values, and that can be uh, uh, caught easily by not only intersecting the write sets, but here you also intersect the read set of um, your transaction with all transactions that committed. Yeah, not so you uh, intersect your write set with uh, the read set of T2 in this case, and then you catch uh, this case that um, you uh, wrote to X that was uh, read by transaction T2, and with that you actually catch write skew. Footnote, Oracle doesn't detect this. Oracle claims it's serializable, it is not. It only has snapshot isolation and they don't care. I don't know, no? but it's, it's really wild. So maybe it tells you something about backward compatibility, Maybe it's not important to them, but Oracle is not serializable. Yeah? They, they have an isolation level that, that, that the, which name is serializable, but it's snapshot isolation, actually. I don't know. Yeah, that's how it is. And we talked about phantoms. That's the example from the Postgres doku, which wouldn't work. But it's basically on a high level, it's the same as a um, write skew just on an aggregated query. It's kind of the same scenario. And for that, you need some sort of predicate logs to catch that uh, to be fully serializable and don't have these phantoms. So summary is um, database uses many different techniques to keep the data in different versions. Um, main takeaway is virtual memory management can be leveraged. You have different venues for versions, of course. And there's a principal trade-off as always storage overheads versus efficiency. MVCC is the state-of-the-art concurrency control algorithm used by almost all relational database management systems. I all use different versions, of course, different variants. Core ideas to allow for different versions of the database. You have to be uh, careful with certain error scenarios that may occur like write skew and phantoms. Um, yeah, and this one footnote, this one thing is really to in a main memory system that runs transactions so fast, is it really required to do concurrency control? Yes, if you have all your transactions and none of them get stored by a user, you can also run them in serial because the performance of these systems is insane. Yeah, one, one question. To chat GPT, any proposal? I <laughs> know oh, it's down, okay, whatever. Sometimes it is, it's really high load on, on the, the service here. Okay, so let's do my final slide. Yeah? So for the entire lecture, database systems are great. I hope I could convey that message throughout that semester. They provide tons of useful solutions for problems you will run into when developing applications. So that's what I phrase the laziness principle in database systems. Yeah? Yeah, you can develop it yourself using locking, concurrency control mechanisms, threading, whatever, or you map it to a database system, problem solved, yeah? your choice, yeah? up to you. Don't solve the problems yourself, delegate it to the database system. It works in many cases. Of course, you have to fiddle with the interface of the database system, uh, SQL. It's not the greatest language in the world, but hey, it works. So. It saves redundant developing and testing time, which is very important. Make sure you understand what a database system can offer and what not. Make sure to understand the different databases may be suitable for different scenarios like analytics, transactions, anything in the middle and so forth. Make sure you configure your database system correctly. Isolation levels, buffer sizes and stuff like that. For instance, Postgres ships with completely insane small buffer sizes which don't make sense. I should uh, do that. Yeah, thanks for your attention. I think you learned something in the lecture. See you next week for the probation exam. Yeah, this time lecture. Thanks. <clears throat>